So the goal of the session is um, basically we're going to cover how to build an affordable vSphere uh, home lab for the, uh, either your personal use or for a small business. Um, virtualization, you know, as you know, doesn't have to be expensive. You don't have to go out and buy big fancy hardware and that. Um, we're going to kind of show you how you can get by on a budget to build a, you know, something that's affordable that you're not going to have to spend a lot of money on. We'll explain uh, how to navigate through the, the many different options ranging from you know, the storage decisions, your server decisions, and all sorts of other hardware decisions. Um, so you can kind of make the, the environment um, tailored to your needs and um, you know, at, a, at an affordable price. Okay, this is where I take over. So before I start, can I just get an uh, indication from uh, all of you out there? Who, who currently runs their own vSphere lab at the moment, so either at home or at work? Alrighty, so, so quite a few people. So um, probably had mixed experiences, probably running it all on different hardware, everything ranging from enterprise level right through to, you know, for example, your, your home lab at home, maybe running on a desktop PC or laptop running under workstation. So the question is, why, why would you build a vSphere lab initially? So there's four main reasons I see it. So first one that's very popular with people out there is around exam studies. So if you're sitting for your VCP uh, accreditation, for example, one of the newer VMware uh, certifications available now, that's a good reason to actually run your own vSphere lab. Last thing you want to be doing is sort of, uh, you know, learning the product on the fly on your production environments, you know, because guarantee something's going to go wrong and, uh, you know, you don't want to be held accountable for that. So that's, a, that's, that's one of the good reasons for actually having your own sandpit, as it were, to uh, actually play in. You can make mistakes. It doesn't matter. You're not affecting anyone else. Second reason being uh, hands-on learning ties into the first one a little bit there. And the third one could be, for example, home infrastructure. Uh, you may not want to learn about VMware, for example, or vSphere. You might, might just want to know enough just to get you by, but you might want to run your... Uh, for example, a proxy uh, or, or some sort of firewalling system. If you've got kids, for example, you want to monitor what their, you know, the websites they're accessing. So that's another good reason. So rather than run multiple, multiple machines running different services or uh, applications, you could have one box just running all of those. And the, and the fourth one, which uh, you know, I, I, my, myself personally, it falls into the category. I like to do it because I can. I'm a complete geek. I put my hand up. Um, I, I love playing with sort of technology. I love uh, you know playing with products, real bleeding edge type of stuff. Uh, I like to kick the tires on it and uh, see what I can do with it. And so, uh, there are a few reasons there why people may want to uh, build their own vSphere lab in the first place. Okay, so what makes up a vSphere lab? So, first part, as you probably guessed, you need a server. Second part, some storage from which to uh, run your VMs from. Now, that storage could either be on hard disks, actually within the server itself or maybe on a separate box, uh, such as a, a, a NAS uh, appliance. Okay, so the other option you've got as well is um, a VSAs. You could run a, a virtual uh, storage appliance. Next bit, you need some network. That's the bit that brings it all together, lets everything talk to each other. And obviously, you need the hypervisor. Without that, you're not running a vSphere lab. <coughs> so, uh, and the other thing is that you need to add to the equation is a operating system. Uh, the most common that I see out there, myself included, I like to run uh, Microsoft Windows. Reason being, most of my clients that I deal with on a daily basis run Windows. Of course, run a little bit of Linux in there as well. Another consideration as well that uh, is often overlooked, people have the best intentions to go out there, I want to build my own vSphere lab. They never think about cooling a power at all, especially if you're running at home. So that's uh, definitely a consideration you've got there, especially if you're running enterprise hardware. It can be very costly. And the last part is time can be a complete time sink. I don't think that's personally. I don't think that's a bad thing. Me personally, I, I spend a lot of time in, uh, in my lab environment, uh, but I see it as an investment in my career. Uh, like I say, it's a great way of learning, uh, learning new products. For example, if you can get on the beta programs with, v, uh, with VMware, great way to learn. So uh, definitely got to factor that in as well. Okay, the um, hardware compatibility guide. Um, this is uh, on VMware's website, and what it is is uh, basically a list of all the various hardware components that are supported by uh, ESX and ESXi. Um, this guide is pretty critical because um, for, for a couple of reasons, which we'll go into uh, mainly for support and that it actually the hardware works with uh, vSphere. It's split up into different sub guides. So if you want to find uh, basically a server making model, you can go to that guide. There's storage devices for all the different, you know, from the SAN to the ISCOSI to NFS. And then finally, there's the I.O. devices, which um, lists all the supported NICs and uh, storage controllers. The, the guide's updated frequently. It's, it's an ever-changing guide. There's hardware that's um, removed from the guide. Um, mainly, vendors will um, remove hardware um, that they don't want to support anymore. And uh, there's also hardware being added to the guide um, as vendors certify their hardware with, uh, um, for use with vSphere. 
Um, why is it important? Um, <coughs> a couple reasons, like I mentioned, ESX and ESXi has a limited set of hardware device drivers built into it. If you use a hardware component that there is no driver for, then it's probably not going to work. You won't be able to use that, that storage adapter or the uh, network card that's in your server. Um, the other reason is that VMware only supports um, server hardware that's listed on that guide. That doesn't mean they, they won't help you um, with vSphere at all, but if it's related to the hardware, um, they, they probably won't provide support for that. They want you to reproduce it on supported hardware. Um, even though hardware is not listed on that guide, it still will work in a lot of cases in that. So um, it, it's best to um, kind of use hardware that's on there since you know it's going to work. Um, the critical area is I.O. adapters because if your storage adapter or your network adapter isn't supported or it doesn't have the driver for it, then you're basically you know, out of luck. You're not going to be able to see your storage or connect to the network. So that's a, the real critical area that you want to make sure you're using a network or storage adapter that is listed on the guide and is supported. Um, even if it's not listed on the guide, you can sometimes go into the, the forums, the forums um, or there's a white box site that kind of lists some of the, the, the hardware that does work with vSphere that isn't listed on the guide specifically. Um, for, for hardware to get on the guide, um, the vendors must fill out applications and then um, basically VMware does uh, third party testing with that hardware before they'll actually build the driver into um, vSphere and then provide support for it. Um, then it becomes certified and listed on the guide. Um, VMware does not enforce an uh, expiration period for hardware to add to the guide. Um, it's up to each vendor to certify that their hardware um, for the most current product releases. So when uh, the next version of vSphere comes out, um, vendors have to recertify their hardware with that new release. Um, it's up to the vendor to do that. It's not up to VMware. VMware doesn't actually um, go out and tell vendors to do this. It's always up to the vendor to be able to um, update that, their hardware and um, get everything listed on the guide that should be there. As I mentioned, the VMware Global Support Services will uh, provide support for vSphere running on um, hardware not listed on the guide. Um, but if the problem is hardware related, they'll probably tell you to um, reproduce it on something else. Like I said, you should always check the guide before, before buying hardware. I've, I've made that mistake once where I actually bought an I.O. adapter that wasn't listed on the guide. I just assumed it was a name brand, HP branded um, hardware or network adapter and went to put it in. It, it didn't work. So it's critical because you can waste a lot of money buying stuff that may not work with vSphere. And um, so you always want to check to make sure it's listed on the guide and uh, go through there. And for the version that you're using, because there are different versions listed in there that you want to make sure that you're using um, that hardware is going to work on the, the version that you're using. Um, there's also unofficial guides. Like I mentioned, there's a the website called vm-help.com. They have a kind of an unofficial listing of things that are known to work with certain v versions of vSphere. So you could also check that as a resource to kind of find out if um, some of the hardware that may not be listed on the guide is going to work. Um, for newer hardware that's not yet listed on the guide, um, contact your vendors because a lot of times it's in the works and they'll tell you, well, we will support this hardware in the next, in the next release or it's upcoming. So always check with the vendor to see if um, they are planning on supporting the hardware that you're planning on buying um, before you actually buy the product to make sure they're going to be able to support it. Ensuring hardware compatibility. Um, if you plan on using specific features like fault tolerance, um, always do your homework because it's, it's, some of these features are very specific. They have to have certain chipset features and stuff like that for them to be able to work. Fault tolerance in particular is, uh, has some pretty strict requirements. So always make sure um, the guide also lists certain features, whether they're supported on certain hardware. So check the guide there, and you could also um, you know, check with the vendor itself to see if they supply that, um, that hardware feature that's needed to use a certain VMware feature, and we'll go over those in a minute. Um, check with the vendors to see if they have the required hardware, like I mentioned, for I can tell, for example, for um, the VT-D feature or for uh, AMD, the IO MMU, which is required for VM Direct Path. So check with them directly. So the, the model of server that you're planning on buying, check with them to see, hey, does it support this feature or not? Because after you buy the server, you don't want to get burned and find out that you know, it doesn't support that feature. CPU it can be critical because um, there's a lot of uh, specific VMware features, vSphere features that require certain model CPUs to work. Um, they have a, VMware has a knowledge base article that lists all the Intel and AMD uh, websites for uh, CPU features. And um, so basically you can kind of go through and see if the actual CPU that you're buying um, will support uh, the feature that you're, you're wanting to use with vSphere. Checking for things like uh, CPU P state and C state support can be tricky. Um, those are basically used for uh, power management. They'll actually um, power the, the CPU up and down to uh, kind of conserve on power. 
Um, the vendors don't specifically list that a lot of times. Most modern servers have that, but if you plan on using that feature, the dynamic voltage and frequency scaling of the, the CPU to save power, always check with the vendor on that one to make sure that they just support it in the server that you're buying. Um, don't ever make assumptions with I.O. adapters. Um, the onboard white box NICs are, are often not supported, so if you buy a, a cheap server um, you know, or a, a motherboard um, and build your own white box, a lot of times those NICs won't work with vSphere and that. They don't, it doesn't contain the driver, so um, in, in a lot of those cases you have to buy your own uh, supported I.O. cards like the network adapters and put them in the, the server for, that, for them to work. Um, you can use SATA adapters with vSphere, but um, they don't officially support SATA with RAID. So um, if you, can, you can actually install vSphere on a, a server, a white box, whatever, that's using a, a SATA adapter, but you just can't RAID it. Almost all shared storage will work because you're actually connecting over the network to it. It's not directly hooked up to the server. So even if your shared storage isn't listed specifically on um, the uh, hardware compatibility guide, if it's in uh, iSCSI or NFS, um, almost all of them work. So in most cases, you can always use shared storage with whatever uh, server you're, you're buying. Here's some of the features that require specific server hardware. Um, vSphere in general requires 64-bit CPUs and also Intel VT or AMD-V um, if you plan on running 64-bit VMs. Uh, the VM Direct Path feature requires the Intel VT-D feature or AMD IOMMU. Uh, the VT-D has been out for a while now. Uh, AMD is finally releasing the IOMMU. It's starting to come out in some of the newer servers like the Proliant G7s. Um, so always check to see if the, that server supports that before you buy it. For distributed power management, the uh, NICs with uh, Wake on LAN, that's not the preferred method of using DPM, um, but that will work. So you can uh, make sure the NIC that you're buying supports Wake on LAN, or the preferred methods are using the server IPMI or HP ILOs. Uh, make sure your, your servers support that if you plan on using DPM. As I mentioned, the uh, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, which is the C state and P state changing of the processor for scaling up and down to conserve power. That requires the Intel Enhanced Speed Step technology or AMD Enhanced Power Now. Um, fault tolerance, it's really picky on the CPUs. There's a, a knowledge base article that lists them all, um, all which families will work. Um, in general, it's basically the, the Intel Core 2 and the Core i7 and the, most of the AMD's third generation Optron families. Um, for vMotion, you just have to have similar CPU families. There's no cross-vendor support. You can't vMotion from AMD to Intel, but you can vMotion between the fam you know, within the families um, with different types of um, Intel and, and AMD processors. For enhanced vMotion compatibility, you need the uh, Intel's Flex migration or AMD's AMD V extended migration. Um, so basically, you know, anytime you're looking to use one of these features, always check to make sure that that's included in the hardware that you're buying. Otherwise, you won't be able to use the feature. Okay, off to Simon. All righty, over to me. Okay, so lab servers, as you imagine, will come in all shapes and sizes. Everything from a lowly laptop that you might have uh, running a VM workstation on there, right through to uh, enterprise class hardware. So, for example, if you're uh, you know, an SMB or, for example, you're an enterprise customer wanting to run uh, a lab environment at work, you may be fortunate enough to have access to one of the latest servers out there. So, as you can imagine, complete broad spectrum of uh, hardware that you could be running your labs on. So... Along with that comes a lot of sort of financial considerations, for example, as to what your budget is, whether it's actually coming out of your pocket buying the, uh, the lab environment, for example, if you're running a vSphere lab at home, or if it's your uh, employer or your business playing for it, probably less of a consideration for you personally. Uh, just means that you may have access to more sort of high-end or more, or more modern uh, hardware. So basically, laptop, a white box is a, a, another type of lab server, so uh, a white box, um, I'll go into more detail on each of these shortly, but uh, that's the type of thing, uh, you know, those of you that, uh, I imagine most of you have been in the uh, IT uh, industry for a while, um, and probably dabbled in actually building your own uh, kit at home, so uh, personally, like myself, I actually quite like building a, a, a white box, and generally you get sort of best bang for buck out of there. Another type of lab server you may want to consider is an entry-level server. Because it is a lab environment, as long as you're not going to run uh, production VMs on there, it's less of a consideration with things like uh, you know, resilient power and cooling, um, high-density memory, for example. So you know, let's say you only want to run sort of half a dozen to a dozen VMs. Why, why pay out thousands of dollars or euros or pounds uh, on a high-end server when you could just as well you know, get away with an entry-level server? And then you've got the big guys at the top there, enterprise servers. So these can either be, like I mentioned, sort of uh, brand new uh, uh, servers, perhaps you know, from the likes of uh, Cisco, HP, IBM, or 
They could be serviced, for example, every three to five years, your company that you work for are doing a hardware refresh, and uh, they just skip all their own old equipment. Personally, I've picked up a lot of kit that way in the past. It's great. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. So I'm just going to run a, three, a, a, few, a, a um, few of the uh, pros and cons of each of those. So as you'd imagine, branded PC or laptop, what you get with that is, well, you've probably already got the kit already. So low cost, you may uh, purchase it yourself, or most of us these days get given a laptop or, or, uh, or similar at work. So easy to obtain, cheap to run, great thing as well, especially if you want to run your own labs at home, is that it's quiet and also uh, very cost effective. Problem with that, though, uh, as you'd imagine, it's not going to be on the uh, compatibility list, at least for uh, vSphere, unless you're running it under workstation. Um, and also small memory capability. Most laptops now will easily take four gigs with, with the number out there sort of taking eight gigs or more. But they're more of an exception in the rule generally, unless you're paying, uh, uh, purchasing a high-end laptop. So the next type, um, white box. This can be quite an enjoyable experience if you're uh, sort of if you have a leaning towards being a, a bit of a computer geek and like build, building your own kits. So uh, this can be great. You can go down to the uh, computer fair on Saturday morning, purchase all the kits, build it up in the afternoon. But as Eric uh, mentioned before, one thing you've got to be very careful of is ensure that the, uh, the, the hardware that you purchase will actually run vSphere. Now, guaranteed, obviously, uh, like the laptops, desktops, and also the white box, they're not going to be on the uh, VMware compatibility list at all. So one thing I'll say to you, before you blow your money, uh, or waste, potentially waste your money, just ensure that, do your homework on the forums. There's a couple of really good uh, sites out there where basically they keep a database of what uh, people in the community have found to work and not work. Um, obviously, all these solutions here, if it's not running on uh, VMware uh, you know, approved ha hardware, you're not going to be able to expect to go to VMware and say, hey, you know, I've got issues. Can you help me out? So, uh, but then again, that's all part of running your own lab environment. Um, you haven't got the uh, price tag associated with it. So um, the other thing, like I mentioned, potential vSphere compatibility issues. Uh, and also, you're not going to get the high-end um, uh, enterprise-type features, such as you know, resilient PSUs, uh, memory, hard disks, that type of thing. But then again, you've got to ask yourself the question, if it's a lab environment, why, why would you need that in the first place? So that's the second type of... Um, Lab server you might want to consider. Me personally, I like the white box, but I uh, very much like the entry level servers. I think they, you know, they offer a really good uh, bang for buck. Um, I run in my own lab at home. I run uh, HP uh, ML 110s and 115s. To give you an idea, over in the UK, I could pick these up about 18 months ago for around about 80 pounds, so about 150 bucks. Uh, that's with either an Opteron or a Xeon processor. So that's phenomenal value for money. Um, with uh, uh, VMware 3.5, there were some compatibility issues, but as time's gone on, right up to vSphere and 4.1, no problem at all. You just put in the CD, it just sees all the hardware, albeit you know, the hardware's not on the actual official compatibility list at all. The other good thing with it as well, if you've got a small office or you, know, you have it running in your lounge or your basement, for example, it's very quiet as well. It doesn't generate a lot of heat, uh, unlike the uh, enterprise servers. Um, and also power costs as well. To give you an idea, my ML110s consume around about 80 watts of power. Uh, if they're doing a lot of work, maybe 110, 115. So uh, that's the other thing. If you're going to run this 24-7 at home, uh, it's obviously going to hurt you in the pocket if you're running enterprise servers 24-7. Uh, OK, uh, next one. Right, old enterprise servers. Like I say, you know, your company may be doing a hardware refresh, or you may know of a company doing that. So you jump into their skip, start pulling out sort of... Uh, Likes of HP ProLiant, G3s, G4s may seem like a really good idea at the time, but um, it could be a little bit of a false economy, especially if you're running it at home. Uh, I know Simon's had personal yes. experience from this. ML570 um, G1. Yeah, you try running a 570 in your garage, for example. You know, you wait till your first month's power bill comes back, and then you know all about it. And definitely also the noise as well. I know people that have, you know, uh, for example, had 500 series HP servers. Even in their basement, they're sitting in their lounge, they can still hear the noise coming up through the floor. So it may seem like a really good idea at the time, but uh, just keep those sort of things in mind when you're uh, looking at um, uh, purchasing a lab server. Definitely for an SMB environment as well. You know, you may only have one large office, open plan office with lots of desks in there. Um, those sort of things you don't want to start putting in closets just because of the heat they generate. Uh, other thing as well, on the downside, memory dims. Um, you, you're talking about uh, a sort of two, three-year-old servers potentially. That's back when four gigs was deemed quite a decent amount of memory. But these days, if you're running a lab environment, you probably want to be looking at around about eight gigs or more memory if possible. So uh, you jump onto eBay, the one thing, the first thing you'll notice is that actually enterprise memory, uh, registered memory, for example, holds its value really well. So once again, a bit of a false economy. It may seem like a great idea at the time, but you want to might, uh, think a few of these things through. 
So what makes up a, a, a service? So first one is uh, CPU considerations. As Eric's already mentioned, um, basically you've got two choices or, or two paths to go down, either AMD or Intel. One thing I will say to you, if you've got a preference sort of one, think about it and then try to stick to it if possible because uh, you may think initially, hey, I just want to run one lab server. Guaranteed, once you get a taste for it, you, you know, you want to add another server and start using some of the real sort of fun features. For example, you know, uh, fault tolerance, DRS, HA in your lab environments. Problem is, if you've got an Intel server, an AMD server, that's not gonna work. So uh, think early on in the piece and think, okay, you know, do I wanna start using AMDs or Intels and make that decision sooner rather than later? Uh, other stuff that you need, once again, that Erica mentioned, sort of uh, make sure that the CPU is ideally Intel VT and EM64T uh, are compatible uh, to, to, to run VMs on there. And like I've got there, there's a really good knowledge base article from VMware that outlines that. Um, hyper-threading as well, that's a nice to have. Some of the newer Intel processors have come out. They've actually got the hyper-threading sort of right this time, and uh, that's quite good if you can get that. But generally, you know, you'll only be seeing that if you're buying actually a brand new enterprise server, or for example, building your own white box with a, uh, something like a, you know, an, I, an i7, for example. Okay, so moving on. Uh, other stuff as well, let's say you inherit uh, a, a server from somewhere. Um, how do you know? How do you know what sort of features it's got? You know, will I be able to run HA? Will I be able to run DRS? Great little util uh, that you'd wanted to get, bring down. Uh, it's free as well from VMware is CPU ID. Uh, you can bend that off onto a CD, for example, boot off of that, run that, and that'll tell you whether it's uh, got a lot of the features that you'll need to run some of the more advanced or, or fun features that you get with vSphere. So I've uh, got the shortcuts of that there. Okay, other things as well, like Eric said, you can't move between AMD and Intel for things like you know, fault tolerance, uh, DRS, for example. But what you can do, let's say you've got uh, two Intel CPUs, um, you've got to be a little bit careful because if you've got a very early generation of an Intel CPU and a later generation, traditionally, you may not have been able to do DRS between the two. But what you've got is a, a feature there called uh, enhanced vMotion uh, compatibility. And that will uh, sort of put a mask uh, over it to allow you to... Uh, uh, to overcome some of those limitations about moving VMs between different uh, uh, models or generations of CPU. Okay, fault tolerance. Once again, that can be quite a fickle beast if you want to get that up and running. You've almost got to have relatively the same CPUs in, uh, in each of your uh, servers there. Once again, really good uh, um, VMware knowledge base article around that. Uh, another thing as well, uh, obviously the, uh, the green issue is uh, very big these days want to think about power saving, look at the CPU, see whether it's got a couple of features. For example, if you're running Intel, such as SpeedStep or PowerNail from AMD, um, these can potentially save you a lot of money. And also, if you want to try out uh, uh, one of the features like DPM and vSphere, uh, that will definitely uh, you know, let you do that. Um, okay, big thing, memory. Like I've got there, memory is king. You will find that... Uh, in, you know, even in your production environments, if you go to most of your environments there, look at your CPU utilization, okay? Unless you've got some real heavy lifting sort of Oracle or SQL databases, even with 20 VMs on a single server, you're going to see it sitting, sitting there on a modern CPU, you know, dual socket quad core, for example. It's probably sitting there twiddling its thumbs at about 20%. But what vSphere will do, it will consume your memory like crazy. Um, so uh, the more memory you can get into your lab server, the better. Now, obviously, with an older server, uh, for example, an old enterprise server, you're going to have issues there because basically high-density high, um, high DIMMs went around back then. But if you're building a white box or you've got a modern uh, entry-level server, that's less of an issue. But the, the more DIMM sockets you can get in there, generally the better. Okay, two types of uh, memory considerations there. Um, basically... Um, ECC, non-ECC, uh, be careful with that. So, you know, quite often I, I, I see people, for example, on the blog, they'll, they'll ask questions such as, well, I've, we've just done a hardware refresh at work, and I've got a uh, HP server at home, and I want to install, you know, I've got a, uh, a ProLiant G5 at home. We've just refreshed all our, our brand new G6s or G7 servers. I've taken the memory out of there, and I want to put it at home. You know, let's, let's say it's DDR2, for example, and it doesn't work. Um, that's more a case of registered versus non-registered memory. Um, you've got to sort of be aware of particular memory types such as that. So make sure that, uh, you know, if you're running registered memory, uh, make sure that you purchase registered memory to put in there. If, for example, you're running a sort of more of an entry-level server and you've taken memory out of a uh, more of an enterprise-level server at work, generally it's not going to run in your, uh, in, in your server at home. So uh, that also uh, applies to EC and non-ECC. Less of an extent, because if you do put uh, ECC 
memory into a, a non-ECC socket, uh, it will just not use that functionality. So just a couple of considerations there around the memory. Uh, disk and storage controller, um, that's probably one of the most problematic components of a server. And um, reason being, less so these days, like with vSphere 4.1, most of my lab servers, like I say, you know, the HP MO110s, you just put the CD in and away it goes. That's, that's also true of the Dell uh, T-Series as well. So you've got a lot of choices there. A lot of people decide just to go with the onboard RAID. Now, personally, I, I wouldn't recommend using the onboard RAID unless you're sort of using an enterprise class type server. The uh, reason being, uh, either you'd not, be able to, you'd not be able to do RAID on there or you just won't get the throughput off of it. Um, so quite often, if you've got, uh, probably purchased yourself a nice entry-level uh, RAID adapter in there, uh, you're going to get better performance off there as well, and you'll be able to guarantee that you'll be able to run RAID, uh, whether it's off SAS or SATA disks. Um, other thing as well, if you're booting ESX, uh, ESXi, for example, you may want to consider running it off a USB memory stick. Um, I personally like doing that, especially in a lab environment, because the great thing is, if you're doing testing, for example, you can have a number of memory sticks. You can have one with 3.5 on there, you can have one with 4, one with 4.1. The great thing is, if you want to test, it's just a case of powering down the server, taking that USB stick out, plugging the other one in, bringing it up, and all of a sudden you're running on that particular version of, uh, of ESXi. So you get a lot of flexibility with that, as opposed to installing ESX or ESXi actually onto the local hard disk. Um, right, so, yep, just covered it off there. Dedicated hardware base is, is much better. Also, consider about RAID as well. Do you actually need to run RAID? Um, I personally, I think it's a good idea because even in a lab environment, the amount of time you're going to waste, let's say your hard disk fails, rebuilding it uh, again, especially if you've taken the time to build up templates, can be tight, quite time-consuming. So, you know, I'd, I'd always advise getting some sort of level of RAID or at least backup in there. Okay, uh, networking, a few basic questions to ask yourself. How many NICs do you want? Well, obviously, you can use you know, a, a single NIC, but just use VLANing on there. Um, it depends how close you want to take your lab environment to uh, following VMware best practices um, on that one. Um, if you want to add more, port, uh, more uh, network ports, obviously the choices you've got open to you are, you know, either via a PCI, PCI-X, or PCIe slots. Um, always go for gigabit cards. That's what I definitely recommend, you know, because even if you're running VLANing on there, you might be running management traffic. Hey, that probably just needs a 10 meg connection on there, but you might also want to run over there, you know, fault tolerance or NFS or iSCSI traffic over there as well. So hedge your bets. You may not want to do it at the moment, but going forward, you know, guaranteed at some stage you will probably want to run something over there that'll need gigabit type speeds. Okay, so this is just a, a, an average type environment. Um, if you want to follow Microsoft back practices, best practices, you'd have a port for a service console, one for VM traffic, one for vMotion, fault tolerance, and then your, any iSCSI or NFS traffic. So that's five ports if you want to run it on actual physical ports without using VLANing. Add resilience into the mix. Most people wouldn't do that, bother in a, a lab environment, but all of a sudden you're talking about 10 ports uh, or 10, uh, 10 um, network ports that you need coming out the back of your server. That's why in a lab environment, you probably want to consider using VLANing because it gets rather expensive otherwise. So it's not only the ports you've got to have at the server end, but also on the, uh, uh, on the network switch as well. Okay, uh, popular PCIe cards. I personally, I use Intel Pro uh, 1000 PT uh, cards or the HP NC380T. They've worked a treat for about the last two years for me. You can pick them up rather, uh, rather cheaply on uh, eBay and uh, Craigslist and the like. So uh, have a look there. The quad, the quad port cards are still holding their uh, price very well. Uh, so in most cases, you'll probably be looking at buying uh, dual port cards. Right, uh, networking switches. Uh, most instances for a lab environment, you won't have the luxury of the budget of buying layer three switching that allow you to do routing. Or routing. Um, so uh, you'd be looking at a, a layer two switch. Um, I personally, I use, there's a nice little Linksys switch, the SLM2008, that works a treat. Gigabit ports. Um, but what you would want to look at, uh, always look for either a smart switch or a managed switch. If you look for unmanaged, you're not going to be able to do too easily things such as QoS, jumbo frames, that type of thing. So you want a little bit of control around your management uh, uh, of your network switch, but you don't want to obviously spend too much money. Um, so, like I've got there, definitely get, get a switch with VLAN tagging, QoS, and jumbo frames. If you want to do routing or routing, um, <laughs> you might want to consider the uh, Viata Core uh, virtual appliance. It's free to download, um, absolutely fantastic. It's a treat, and it's free, which is rather cool. So, I'll hand on over to Eric. Okay, installing a ESXi on a USB flash drive. Um, there's two versions of ESXi. There's the embedded version, and there's the installable version. Um, a lot of people like to basically just install it onto a flash drive and they can boot right from that without having to uh, install it onto a hard drive and they can use that for uh, VMFS storage. Um, it, it's really easy and simple to set up. Um, basically the requirements are you just need a, a one gig flash drive and 
Um, there's some talk now with 4.1 that you might need an actual bigger drive than that. I think the, they may have increased the size of it. Then you just get the, uh, the basic ins uh, E6i installable ISO image. You can use any uh, flash drive. Um, officially, though, if you go to, if you have like an HP server, um, if you look at the, uh, some of the tech notes and uh, hardware compatibility guide, you, they say that you have to buy the flash drive from the vendor. There's a specific model flash drive that you have to buy to have officially supported ESXi from a flash drive. It'll work in any flash drive, but um, for if you want official support from VMware, uh, go to Dell or HP or whatever, and they actually have a part number for, it, it's basically just a regular flash drive that has their name on it. Um, to be able to use so you get support. Uh, performance can vary widely between brands, sizes, and models. Um, there's some USB uh, kind of like speed step program that actually will go out and measure the speed of drives. Um, the read and write speeds will, can vary um, pretty much. Uh, you can go out and test the drive if you have a variety of them to see which one performs the fastest. Um, it's not entirely critical because there is not a lot of reading and writing done to that flash drive once ESXi actually boots and comes up. Um, but it's always best to have the, the best performing model um, if you plan on using ESXi. Uh, the server must support booting from a USB drive. Uh, most modern servers do that. A lot of times you have to go in the BIOS, set that up, configure your boot order for your devices, and you just move the, um, the USB drive or removable storage up to the top so you can boot off of that. And you can use it either internally or externally. It works in both. Personally, I'd recommend internally because if you, somebody walks by and, and knocks that thing out, and then your, your server is pretty much down. So always go internally. Most modern servers will have a slot. Um, even the white box servers now have a, a little USB slot on the motherboard. So you can just open the server up, plug your drive in, and then you're, you're good to go. You can boot right off of that. But you can go either way, either internal or external. Uh, to get it onto a, a flash drive, you install ESXi as you normally would on, you know, to a hard drive, but you'll get an option when you're installing it to select its device, and if you have a flash drive plugged in, you'll see that on the list. So you select the flash drive, and then it'll install onto the flash drive. There's also a way to kind of maybe uh, to pre-build a uh, ESX flash drive. You can use um, Workstation to install it to a VM, and um, that, that's just another way to basically use that flash drive on that VM install it to there, and then you could just take it out and, um, and stick it into your, your server and you can boot right up. Um, quality flash drives can last um, many years and over 10,000 write cycles. Um, don't use, if you're going to use it, don't use any of those cutesy, kind of free, cheap handout ones you get. Um, try to use a quality flash drive and that, you know, otherwise if, if you use a cheap one, there's a chance that it could fail at some point, you know, rather quickly down the road and that. So if you buy a good brand name drive, though, it, it'll last a, a lot of write cycles, 10,000 is the minimum. A lot of them last a lot longer than that. Um, you can use USB image tools to clone or backup flash drive. So there's tools to actually, once you build one, you can uh, clone that or make a backup. It'll make a little uh, image file copy of it. So it's a, a good way to, if you can make multiple ones, you can create, keep creating clones of that flash drive and, and writing them to new drives. And that way you don't have to keep installing it every time. Once you have a good one made, all you have to do is clone it and then plug it into a server. Um, it's also good if you want to back up your image. You have to take the server down to do it. But you can just pop that flash drive out, and make an image copy backup of it, and then you always have a, an up-to-date copy of that server. And now we're going to talk about shared storage, um, physical devices. There's uh, lots of them to choose from, and that, a lot of affordable ones that you can get out there, ranging from like the Drobos to the, uh, the Netgears, the iOmegas, um, the Synology. Um, so there's a lot to choose from. Um, some of the more popular ones are like the Drobo Pro and Elite. Um, the one disadvantage of those is they only support iSCSI, and, and those tend to be a bit more expensive. Um, some of these devices come with drives built in, and some you have to buy that. You just buy in the case. You have to add drives to it later. Uh, Synology, uh, the DS410 and DS1010. Uh, iOmega, the iX2-200 is only a, it's a two-drive unit. And then one of the most popular ones that people are using are, is the iX4-200D, which is a four-drive unit. And you can actually, that, it, it comes with drive, and it's actually pretty affordable. You can get those, uh, the four uh, terabyte models for usually under 700 bucks. So that's, that's a real popular unit, and it has lots of other great features. If you want to use it for things more than a, a vSphere, it does support both iSCSI and NFS. Netgear has their ReadyNAS, NF, NVX, and Pro. Uh, QNAP has their TS259, 459, and 809 Pro. And uh, Thekus makes uh, N4200 and N7700. Okay, when using uh, shared storage devices, always use one gigabit. It's a must. And if you try to run VMs off a 100 megabit link, they'll, they'll, they'll crawl. They're, they'll pretty much be unusable. So always have a gigabit switch, a gigabit port on your uh, shared storage device, and um, that way you'll get the best performance to um, be able to run VMs. Um, it, it works with 100 megabit, but it just runs dog slow, and it's pretty much unusable. 
Um, iSCSI and NFS are built into vSphere, so you don't really need anything additional. Um, it, it works with any physical NIC, so the iSCSI initi initiator and the NFS client are both there already, so all you have to do is configure them and you're good to go. Um, most affordable shared storage devices are listed on the vSphere hardware compatibility guide. Like I mentioned earlier, it's not critically important because you're connecting over the network to device, so pretty much any device is going to work, but a lot of those smaller ones now are all on that guide, so just go you know, check the guide if you want official support and uh, you'll find most of the um, most of those on there already. And many of the units have a lot of advanced features. Um, they're they're multifunctional and have multi-raid levels and multi-NICs. Um, so you can do some of the more advanced stuff with those if you want. Um, choosing between uh, iSCSI and NFS is often personal preference. Um, I like using iSCSI, but a lot of people use NFS. A lot of these devices support bo both of them, so if you want to use, um, set up like maybe an iSCSI volume and an NFS volume, you can do that. Um, sometimes it's fun to kind of play around with one compared to the other. Um, they both offer similar performance, but they have kind of, you know, different characteristics. iSCSI is a block level storage and NFS is a file level storage, but they, they, they both work great for, for doing um, on these shared storage devices. Um, budget often dictates what you get. You can get all the way down to the small little iX2 units for a couple hundred bucks, um, or you can go, you know, spend up to, uh, you know, a couple thousand bucks if you buy some more advanced units, like the Drobos, you know, fully loaded with eight bays and that, so. Um, basically, whatever your budget is, just look around in that area. Like I said, the, the iOmega, the iX4D, uh, 200D is a very pretty much affordable, and you get four drives, so that's, a, that's often a great popular choice. Um, in general, the more you spend, the better performance you'll get. Um, some of the, if you have four drives, four spindles, that's obviously going to perform better than just having um, a two drive, two spindles, and that you got more spindles to write across. So um, in general, you know, the more you spend on a unit, you can expect the, the, better, the best performance with it. Many units offer special RAID technology. Try not to mix speeds and drives. Um, basically, it allows you to put a, a, like a, a 500 gig drive and a one terabyte drive in there, or drives that are um, completely different from each other. By doing that, it, it's kind of going to bring the whole RAID level down to a, a, really, a, a lower performance level. So try to use the same types and models of drives in all of your um, uh, slots, and, and don't try to mix with the um, different size drives and different types of drives and that. Um, as I mentioned, more spindles, you get the better performance, so you know, try to go with at least four spindles or four drive units. Uh, many units are expandable where you can actually add on a, a separate um, expansion rack. Don't use the USB storage devices on there. That'll be dog slow and just won't run. But they often have uh, external units that'll go connect right to the main unit so you can expand your storage if needed. And there's also low-cost rack mount units available as well, um, like the Synology RS-409, the iOmega, that's the new one, the iX12-300R. On the Netgear ReadyNAS um, 2100. So if you have a rack or if you want to, you know, have an affordable storage in, in that type of environment, you can, those options are available as well. Okay, that's uh, that's kind of the physical devices. Now there's the the VSAs, which are the virtual storage appliances. And basically, what those do is they can turn local storage into shared storage, um, usually with through uh, iSCSI or NFS. And um, they could run physical or virtual. Um, you can install. Um, there's pre-built images that you can install. Uh, like open file or directly on a physical server, then use that as your own NAS, or you can down, um, download VMs that are pre-built that can turn a, a server's, um, like an ESX server's local storage into shared storage, and then all the other hosts can connect to that and use that as shared storage, which enables you to use, take advantage of the local storage without buying a, a, a separate shared storage unit, and you can take advantage of all the other features, um, you know, vSphere that requires shared storage. Um, it, this way it can often be cheaper than buying a dedicated device. A lot of these, um, you could buy both paid and free VSAs. Uh, the free ones, like OpenFiler, um, you know, won't really cost you anything, and they're easy to set up and run. Um, and it's um, definitely cheaper than you know, buying some of the uh, dedicated device, or you can go the, the, the paid route also. That'll get you some of the um, more advanced features and things like that. Uh, VSAs are a bit more complicated to set up and maintain than, a, a, the, than the, the actual um, dedicated shared storage devices. Things like the iOmega, you just plop it down, turn it on, a couple configuration steps, and you're up and running. With the VSAs, you got a little bit more. Um, you have to install um, ISOs or VMs, set them up and configure them that. Um, it's not terribly difficult, but it is a little bit more maintenance to uh, maintain them and set them up than it is using a dedicated shared storage device. Um, there's a bunch of products to choose from in the VSA line. Um, like I said, the paid apps offer more features such as clustering, replication, and snapshots. Um, for the free VSA option, there's OpenFiler, there's a free NAS, and the EMC Solera Uber. And then for the paid option, there's like the HP Left Hand VSA, the Falcon Store NSS, Starwind, iSCSI SAN, 
and uh, Data Core Virtual SAN. Um, the Star One, I think, actually, they have a free version also that's up to a certain amount of storage if you want to use that. That's basically runs a, you have to install that onto a Windows VM to use that. Open File is one of the most popular choices. It's, um, it's a really nice application to use if you're going to use VSA. Um, it's available as an ISO image to install bare metal on a server, or it's uh, available as a pre-built virtual machine. You just download it, um, put it on a VM, and, and you're up and running. Um, it's all managed via a web browser. So you go into the browser UI, you configure your iSCSI, your NFS, and all the, all the other settings for it, and then um, you're good to go. Uh, Open Fire has many advanced features, like you can do NIC bonding. Um, you can use either iSCSI or NFS, and you can set up clustering. And you know, if you want to use it in a production environment, there is paid support available. So if you do um, you know, run into problems, there's uh, people that will help you out. There's also a lot of forums um, that if you don't want to pay for support and you need support, you can get that way. But if it's critical to have support on that device for, for your environment, there is paid support available for it. Yeah, uh, well, we're just, they were, uh, we're just going to uh, cover off also lab environments. I mean, once again, you're probably going to try and, you know, running it on environments. SMB may have a bit of a smaller budget to, uh, to play with. Uh, like you can see, generally, if you're looking in a lab environment, you're probably going to be looking at sort of three different, uh, one of three different editions of uh, vSphere. So at the entry level, you've got the vSphere hypervisor. That's the new name for ESXi, so that's one to get used to. Because uh, going forward in all the VMware literature, websites, etc., that's what they've uh, started calling it. Uh, as you're probably aware, ESXi or vSphere hypervisor is free. You can do some pretty cool stuff with it up to a point. Uh, so the real enterprise or the, you know, what I consider the, f the fun features, if you're in a lab environment, you want to sort of kick the tires of it and sort of play with uh, the likes of DRS, HA, FT, for example. Unfortunately, you're not going to get that with uh, ESXi uh, out of the box. That said, if you download it, you will get 60 days to actually uh, uh, play with all those uh, extra features. Though, if you're an SMB, for example, going forward after those 60 days, unfortunately, you're going to lose all that uh, additional uh, functionality. But if you're running a lab environment, it may not be too much of a hassle just to sort of uh, create a different email account each time, log on to VMware, download another <laughs> 60 days worth. So. Because nobody does that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no one does that, of course. Um, so uh, that's, that's, that's one consideration there. Next one, the essentials kit. Um, when we're putting the deck together here, the price we were looking at around that was about $495. Gives you a little bit more. Um, for example, what you do, you get the vStorage APIs uh, and also update manager as well. But to be honest with you, you don't get a heck of a lot more than what you'd get with the uh, vSphere hypervisor. We do start to get the real value add stuff if going forward after the 60 days of the eval uh, is actually with the Essentials Plus kit. But unfortunately, as is the world, uh, it comes with a little bit of a uh, larger price tag associated with it. But that said, you know, if you are a business, if you are an SMB, for example, and you want to run this in production, that actually offers very good value for money when you look at the, um, the, uh, the functionality that you get with that, you know, such as, uh, for example, H, uh, you know, high availability, vMotion, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, in a home lab environment or work lab environment, like I say, you know, quite often uh, vSphere hypervisor or ESX may be fine. But like I say, the only hassle being uh, is you've got to refresh it. Uh, every yeah, that... Hey, there we go. So if you are looking at this, definitely do your homework. Because, uh, and also maybe, maybe pay to check with a couple of people as well. Because um, like I say, the licensing model has, has changed around most things recently. So, oh. No, no, they will get you, because they're sort of the smaller SMB uh, packages, um, they will get you a, actually, I think I've got it here, actually. Yeah, so you get two, two processes bundled in. For example, the, uh, the Essentials Plus kit. Uh, that will uh, you'll allow you to spin up up to three servers with two processors. So actually, when you calculate it down, divide that into three servers or so, um, you know, that, that actually works out. That's quite reasonable. And the big thing with that is you get vCenter server with those additions where you normally wouldn't get that. And if you try buying that on your own, it, it's about five $6,000. So that, that's a great, you know, getting the vCenter server bundled in for a cheap price makes these things re real good. Value. It's quite a nice little package for the SMB space, you know, if you're, if, if you're a company with, you know, maybe up to 100 users, a couple hundred users, that could be ideal. You know, keeping in mind also, you know, these days because of the hardware, the CPU disk, for example, you know, you could be running up to, uh, depending on the hardware you're running it on, you could be running 10, 20 VMs on a piece of, uh, single piece of server hardware as well. So 
you know, that's, that's pretty good. So it's not all about the hypervisor. Obviously, you need the hypervisor, very important. But uh, you've got, you've got a, a rather large and an important ecosystem from third-party uh, vendors around that as well. Uh, backups, uh, definitely the SMB and uh, lab environments for the likes of uh, Veeam, vKernel offers some great sort of monitoring type packages. Also, you want to consider your OS as well. I mean, most people I know in their lab environments, they will run predominantly Windows. A little bit of Linux, like you all know. I mean, that, most of that's free. Uh, Microsoft TechNet, that's a fantastic way, even if you're not running a lab environment uh, or vSphere lab environment. Uh, for a couple of hundred bucks, you can pretty much get access to all of Microsoft's uh, catalog of operating systems, applications, and server apps. Um, if you're doing that, have a look around on the web. For example, my website, I always go hunting for discount codes. Uh, it's a year subscription. Have a look around because they are out there and you get about 20, 25% off. So it's worth spending 10 minutes or so to have a look around for a discount code if you want to sign up to that. Another good uh, product as well. I couldn't find a logo for it, but uh, Putty. Very good indeed. Um, that's a free application. Putty is your friend uh, and will let, allow you to uh, SSH onto... Um, uh, onto the ESXi or the ESX boxes to look at things uh, such as, uh, or run applications such as ESX Top. Uh, also, VA Eco Show as well. Um, a great, uh, uh, great package there. So uh, ch check a few of these out. That's just a, just a small, small selection. Obviously, as you can imagine, there's a complete uh, ecosystem around a lot of this. So moving on, I shall hand over to my esteemed colleague here, Luke, who will give you a demonstration. Okay, so I've taken a slightly different tack into this in that um, I spent a lot of time building lab environments, and as Simon mentioned a bit earlier, I've um, probably gone to both extremes, and I used to run an ML570 um, power plant in my, uh, in my garage, which cost me quite a lot of money because it idles at about 800 watts of power. Um, so, you know, I then got into kind of having a lot of these um, lower-end PC servers that Simon mentioned, the ML110s and 115s. Um, I ended up with about five of those, and then you kind of end up with the same problem, because if you're testing multiple versions of vSphere, different configurations, or you just want to play around with stuff, um, I would typically build a new box. So I'm back at the point of having 600 watts of stuff humming away, um, and with power prices being what they are in the UK, that's generally not a favorable way of doing it. So I tried to find the most compact way I could find of doing this stuff. So, you know, I mean, I should level set here that, you know, this isn't a production solution. Whilst what we're talking about here is an eight-node cluster on a single physical piece of hardware, you know, mainly for doing testing, that sort of stuff. You know, there's no real reason you would do this in the real world. The only place you would probably do this in the real world is actually downstairs, because it's the same sort of process that they use to run the labs downstairs. So what we've essentially got in the Vitalis, and if you're British or you watch Doctor Who, you'll kind of get the joke about there being a lot more on the inside than there is on the outside. So we have a single ML115 G5, an AMD quad-core CPU, um, and eight gigs of RAM. Okay, so in the UK, that runs to about 320 pounds, so probably around five, six hundred dollars, um, and that's it, okay? So on top of that, we've got a um, solid-state hard disk, so we actually have two hard disks in there, um, which is obviously isn't included in that price, which is on top of that, but I have a, a SATA disk that comes out of the box and a solid-state drive. Now, the SSD is probably the only thing that makes this feasible. If you imagine the amount of traffic and I.O. that you generate to a disk, uh, with this number of virtual machines, the, the SATA drives just get bogged down and the whole thing um, will end in tears. So essentially we have a vSphere 4 Classic with Service Console installed directly on the physical hardware, booting off the SATA disk. You can use ESXi. I, I honestly, the only reason I use Classic for this is because I port it around quite a lot and it's easier just to be able to have a console physically you can plug a keyboard into. Um, we've then got three core virtual machines that essentially provide the shared services for this machine. Um, so one of them is a virtual machine running Windows and um, vCenter server. Um, in this demo environment, I've got I use um, Open Fileless, so the open source iSCSI SAN. Um, it's got a VMFS data store, which is stored on the solid state drive. Um, and then basically that um, SSD hosted um, iSCSI volume is then mapped out to those purple boxes, which are all virtual ESXi servers. Um, and then we have this Viata um, Layer 3 software router, so to do the IP um, routing for the, all the VLANs. So we've then got, so as of vSphere 4, okay, you had the, whilst it's not supported, you have a way of running um, ESX inside ESX. And this is where it starts to get a little bit kind of headachey because you've now got in this machine eight um, ESXi machines. All of them think they have eight gigs of RAM. And so in total, the cluster, and they're configured into a single eight node cluster. Um, and then inside those virtual ESX nodes, we're running, in my demo environments, I've run up to 60 nested, nested virtual machines. Now, I mean, to be honest, they're not anything heavy duty. You know, they're, um, all they tend to do is boot to the Pixie prompts. Um, they don't have Windows installed in them, but you can do that. Uh, the main reason it's there is because they, this gives you an eight node cluster. 
You can turn on HA, you can turn on DRS, and you can turn on FT. I'll come as, cover some of that stuff in a bit. It doesn't work brilliantly. But it lets you, you know, if you've got scripts and things like that, it lets you run them against this environment, you know, play around with what would otherwise be quite an expensive production system that people would normally purchase. Um, so I spent a lot of time trying to come up with a better acronym, um, but we ended up with that. So as you see in the demo there, it actually thinks it's got 64 gigs of RAM. Okay, and obviously, it's really a 200-pound you know, um, machine, so it's actually physically only got 8 gigs of RAM. So we're making heavy use of oversubscription. Um, I haven't upgraded it yet to 4.1, but I would hope with 4.1 as well, with the memory compression, I could probably squeeze this um, a bit further. So as you see there, eight virtual ESXi machines and 60 nested virtual machines underneath it. So to make this happen, okay, you can't just do this out of the box. It's not like Workstation 7, where you have an option to install an ESX4 guest OS. Um, you basically have to go in and add an extra line into the VMX file, or you can do it via the UI, as you'll see in that screenshot. So there's this monitor control restrict back, tr back restrict back door equals true value that you have to add in there. If you, um, if you don't install that, you can't basically run those, uh, or you can't install those ESX guests and have them run. Okay, so, you know, I, I, I get asked this quite a lot. So, with, do you, you know, the hacks you've made there, does it then mean you can put other things like Hyper-V inside it? Um, you know, I know we're at VMworld or, you know, or Zen server. And with some further hacks, you can install Hyper-V under here. So you can have an ESX box and you can run a Hyper-V server in a virtual machine under it, but you won't be able to have that Hyper-V machine run any of its own virtual machines like you can with ESX. So it only goes a single level of nesting. Um, all you can do is you can frig it so it'll let you install the rule, but you know, if you have to do exams and things like that, that's generally enough because you'll learn how to do all the UI bits of config. The story is a little bit better with Zen in that you can run nested, nested virtual machines with Zen server. So you can have ESX at the bottom, a Zen server virtual machine, and inside that Zen server virtual machine, you can run a Linux virtual machine. Uh, but you can't, as far as I haven't really put too much testing into it, as I understand it, you can't run Windows instead of a Linux VM inside that. Um, so we've got some demos, which I'll probably move on to a bit towards the end, because um, I have to swap machines to do it. Um, but in terms of configuration notes, so it's worth kind of bearing in mind the environment we've got here. I've separated all the networks out internally, but there is no external network switch. So I mean, I, I've got one of those Linksys switches as well, and they work really well where you've got like multiple box setups. But my goal with this was to have all the networking internal to the machine itself. So if I advance my slides, you'll see here that this is basically the, the configuration of the physical host. So we've got a single NIC and a bunch of port groups set up underneath it. And when you install the um, virtual ESXi machines, you give it three VNICs, and you do all the VLAN mapping and everything on the physical host. But that's what it looks like when you're looking at the actual configuration of the virtual ESX box. So we've got all the separate LANs there for storage, uh, you know, vMotion. You can have a separate one for FT and your virtual machine traffic. Um, the quickest way I found doing this is actually was to create a template with all the VNIC configuration. Because if you've got to add four VNICs to a VM, it gets a bit boring to go through every time and configure which port group maps to which. So all I actually did was I had um, a template, but without the OS, also without ESX installed in that template. So the template was literally just bare with the ISO connected with the NICs mapped correctly. Now, the reason I did that is because when vSphere 4 first came out and I tried doing this stuff, if you cloned um, an installed ESXi machine, um, it really, really upset Virtual Center. Um, at the time, there was obviously some unique GUID or something within the machine that every time you added it into Virtual Center, you would then not be able to add any further virtual machines, and it got very upset. Um, I do believe that's been fixed since, um, but I haven't, see, I haven't clarified the position on cloning it, so I generally don't do it in these environments. The other thing to bear in mind is that you're going to need to sweat the uh, promiscuous mode on the vSwitch. So out the box, this will let you install it, and it will go OK, but you won't be able to ping any of the virtual machines that you're running unless you turn on promiscuous mode. Um, that's just because of the sort of some subtleties of the way it works under the hood. So um, you need to pay attention to how many hosts you've got plugged into it. So we've got an open file machine that presents stuff out to iSCSI. Um, basically, you don't want to throw too much traffic at it because you will start to get um, iSCSI locks, and it will all go a bit wrong. So we're a bit short, really, for demos, but let's have a go. And now for some demos. Okay. <laughs> just, to, just keep you awake. Yeah. So essentially what we've got here is, um, unfortunately, some CAN demos, so it's videoed, but I'll show you. So we make a lot of, view, or sorry, you make a lot of use of um, link clones out of this. So if you imagine if you're running this off a solid-state drive, okay, you, they're very expensive. You want to make the best use you can. Sorry. Uh, 
So the best thing I've found with this is to use solid state drive link clone. So if you've got like a Windows VM as a nested nested VM, um, you can just create link clones from it. And as you'll see in a minute, if you can see what's going to go on there, I've got a script that just creates those link clones. But every time, so the, the initial VM is held there and it's maybe only three gig on disk, but then every time I spin up a new Windows nested nested VM, it only uses another gig rather than another three gig every time, which if you've got solid state drives, makes it um, a lot more feasible to use. So as you'll see, it's going to go through now and um, create those VMs. Um, the reason I did this is because it actually shows you how quick it is. So you know, this is actually quite usable with that solid state drive. Okay, so you're not sitting there for hours waiting around like you were with the SATA versions of these things. So as you'll see in a minute, it's got, that job's actually gone. It's going to create. Oh, sorry, we'll get, so it's dispatched the job now to create those link clones. So you know, it literally takes about 10 seconds to create those clones. Then after that, you can power up those VMs, and they will start as normal. So this is a VM running inside a VM on a physical box. So if I skip towards the end, you'll actually see the virtual machine itself being powered on. Okay, so this virtual machine is running inside a virtual ESX server, which is running on a physical ESX server underneath. And they, they generally take about a minute to boot. So you know, the performance isn't bad. For, you know, for lab use and setting up demos and things like that, it's quite a usable solution. Um, and I think with that, we're probably for questions. Anybody have any questions? Or is that the mic right up here coming at us? She just, uh, yeah, I just. The question Sorry, was, um, that slide said AMD only on it? Yeah, so, I, so basically with mine, I've never managed to get the nested, nested virtual machines to work unless it's an AMD chip. Maybe some of the more expensive uh, Intel Xeons can do it. But so there's like an, uh, the Opteron 1534. Is it the one the 115 have got? I think so. Yeah. yeah. So those let you do it. And they're actually FT compatible as well. So you know, they're the cheapest one I've found that lets you do it. And I, I've never found an Intel Xeon low, low enough in the range that you can do it. See, one thing to bear in mind as well, the, the ML115's bang for buck out there, if you're looking at entry-level servers, absolutely fantastic. Offered the best bang for buck, at least in the UK and Europe. The only thing to be aware of, I've been away, made aware that uh, HP are actually dropping the 115, unfortunately. So if you're thinking about getting one, you probably want to get in there sooner rather than later, because <laughs> um, they are being snapped up, because yeah. they do offer great thing, you know, mm. functionality such as FT. <laughs> cool. So, any any other questions at all? Um, and a Mac Mini. Yeah, I mean Mac Mini. I'd love to try it. Actually, what what I've just done? I've got a uh, MacBook Pro, an i7. Uh, I've put an SSD drive in there, and at the moment I'm running Fusion uh, with a nested version of ESX. Um, I've done some preliminary uh, sort of uh, you know performance tests on there, but that seems to run quite well. I can get around about two ESX hosts spun up on a MacBook Pro, an i7 with eight gig of memory running on SSD uh, quite comfortably, and then a few nested VMs in there. So that's kind of cool. So if it, you know for our line of work, it's great if you're going out to a customer site, you want to show them something like SRM or you know just some of the functionality like DRS type of thing between two boxes, uh, and also you know you run uh, OpenFiler or the Celera uh, Uber VSA on there. It's great for doing demonstrations, uh, and the great thing is as well, it's you know cheap to run, it's quiet, and uh, it's pretty have you, good. Is anyone installing ESX bare metal on a mini? I'm not sure whether you would be able to, because you have to. Never actually tried it no. to be honest, uh, but no, it's a good point. I'd like to. Um, just need to uh, get Steve Jobs them. when he comes into town to hopefully uh, <laughs> you know, maybe give out a few. That'd be quite nice. <laughs>